Okay, so good evening. And we're here tonight to talk about preparing your teen with ADHD for driving, to drive safely. And that's something that I know that parents have a lot of thoughts about, oftentimes a lot of trepidation about. And so, and we also know that this is not a topic that is frequently covered in the ADHD literature, although there's some research on this, there's very few uh, handouts, and very few books that have been written that provide guidance to parents and teens about how to navigate the driving process. So we're hopeful that this presentation will be helpful. And so to begin, I just want to show my disclosures. I'm not going to go through them specifically. We, I do get some money from a couple of drug companies to support parent education and provider education. And also there is um, some money that I receive uh, for work on books. Okay, so we're going to talk about the impact that ADHD has on teens, on their behavior and performance. I want to talk more specifically about the impact of ADHD on driving behavior. And then we're going to talk in particular about strategies that parents and teens can use to navigate the learning to drive process. And then even after you have your license, um, how you can help your teen to drive safely and um, hopefully to prevent anything, uh, any um, traffic citations or crashes or anything that, uh, that we parents get really concerned about with our teens. And so I think that you know, most, most of you already understand what ADHD is. We know it to be a neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, for virtually all children uh, and teens with ADHD, we know that it is uh, based in um, a person's neurobiology. It generally has a genetic cause. We know that it affects the ability to control behavior as well as the ability to sustain attention. And ADHD comes in three different varieties or three different presentations. We have ADHD in attentive presentation, which basically refers to individuals who have a lot of inattentive symptoms, but not, not uh, they're lower in the hyperactivity and impulsivity area. And individuals who have the inattentive presentation frequently demonstrate, almost always demonstrate academic impairments. And also, uh, as we're learning more recently, uh, self-esteem difficulties. Those with the hyperactive impulsive presentation, which we typically don't find standing alone in adolescence, but just for purposes of being comprehensive, I'll make reference to it. So individuals with the hyperactive impulsive presentation, uh, as you might imagine, have high levels of hyperactivity and impulsivity, lower levels of inattention, and that type of presentation is associated with impairments in behavior and social functioning. And we typically find this presentation more in the preschool and early elementary years. And then a very common presentation is the combined, which is a, associated with high levels of hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention. And individuals with the combined presentation have a, a, a wide range of impairments, including academic, social, behavioral, and decreased self-esteem. And so we know that ADHD, hi, we know that ADHD can manifest differently Across, uh, across the developmental ages that you know, typically among children, ADHD can present with relatively high levels of hyperactivity as well as inattention. By the adolescent years, um, ADHD, we, we typically find that hyperactivity and impulsivity begins to diminish, um, but that impulsivity um, can remain there to some extent and that um, inattention tends to be quite stable over time as well. So it's not uncommon for individuals who were combined, had the combined presentation during the younger years to perhaps meet criteria for the inattention, inattentive presentation um, by adolescents, perhaps also with some of the impulsivity features, which can certainly get them into trouble when they drive. And so what's the impact of ADHD on teenagers? Well, it certainly can have an effect on their ability to um, control their actions. And you know, research that the neuroscience research that has been done with individuals with ADHD indicates that they have a delay in being able to regulate or control their behavior. They also demonstrate a delay in the ability to self-regulate their emotions. 
Um, in addition, individuals with ADHD typically have organization problems. They have difficulty organizing their materials, organizing books, organizing um, what they might need for school and what they might need for work. In addition, they, um, ADHD is associated with time management and planning problems, as well as difficulties with social decision making and social problem solving. And for that reason, the parents of teens with ADHD uh, typically find that they need to be very involved to provide guidance and support to their teens, perhaps more involved than parents of teens who do not have ADHD, which can set up a, you know, uh, somewhat of a conflict because it's um, natural for teens to want to be more autonomous and more independent and, for, and not to have their parents so involved, yet these are kids who typically need their parents to be more involved. So it can really be very tricky during the teenage years, as you guys would well understand. And so what's the uh, impact of ADHD on driving in particular? And so, you know, we know that beginning drivers are, are at risk for um, traffic citations and crashes. They're certainly more at risk than more experienced or mature drivers. But that novice drivers with ADHD are particularly at risk. And they're at risk for uh, getting um, more traffic citations, uh, at risk for higher rates of accidents or crashes. They're at risk for being at fault when there is a crash, and, um, and they're more, uh, they have a higher rate of getting uh, their license suspended, which is perhaps no, no surprise. And so why are teens with ADHD more at risk for driving difficulties? There are probably a lot of reasons. These are, are some, that have been, uh, some that have been described. Um, of course, uh, individuals with ADHD typically are much more distracted than the norm. Um, and when they're driving, they are frequently distracted by electronics in the car, in particular the, the cell phone, but also the, the other electronics that are, that are present. They sometimes um, have inadequate skills in being able to control the vehicle, perhaps because they haven't practiced enough or really learned to kind of um, you know, control the vehicle as they should. It's um, individuals with ADHD are um, notorious for having poor planning skills, and so they frequently do not anticipate hazards on the road, or what we typically would think about is they don't drive defensively. You know, a good driver obviously will think ahead and think about things that could happen and not wait for something to actually present itself. They might begin to slow down if they enter a, an intersection you know, that, that, that they know to be somewhat tricky or dangerous. Um, but persons with ADHD may not anticipate that and slow down in that situation. They may have an increased willingness to take risks by virtue of their impulsivity. Um, they oftentimes have an overassessment of their driving abilities, they may think that they don't, they're, they're better than the norm. They're, they're better than their peers with regard to driving, and they may not realize that they are at risk by virtue of their distractibility and impulsivity. And also, all teens can be susceptible to peer pressure, but these teens, perhaps, perhaps because of some of their difficulties with social interaction, perhaps because of some of the struggles they've had being accepted by peers, could be more prone to peer pressure, which could have an effect on their driving. So they, oftentimes they tend to overestimate their abilities, not just with regard to driving, but they tend to overestimate their abilities in virtually every area. So um, anyway, I appreciate the comment. So, so let's move into some of the strategies that we can be using in order to uh, promote safe driving among teens. And you know, first and foremost, the, the kind of the hallmark of any intervention approach is a, establishing and maintaining a strong parent-child or parent-teen relationship. That, that really is it's the most fundamental thing that we do in counseling or therapy. And we know from a lot of research that when there is a strong parent-child, parent-teen relationship, um, children are better regulated and they're um, more able to relate effectively with not just with their parent and with um, people in their family but with others outside the family. So um, parent, strong parent-child relationship is kind of a hallmark of, of effective living. And so just as we, you know, we talk about this a lot with parenting younger children but it's equally important in parenting 
um, teens, and, and even when these teens become young adults, is to find time to invest in the relationship, to find time to enjoy your child. Uh, it may be a little bit more difficult to find ways to do that. You're not going to be sitting down and playing with Legos or playing with house or whatever. Um, but there could be times that you can work on a project around the house. You could go to a ball game. You could go shopping together. Um, and those, those activities could provide opportunities for the parent and teen to listen to each other, to affirm each other, to, to let go of um, criticism or, or correction. And just to kind of just enjoy each other's presence. Um, we recommend that, that parents spend time with their teens on a regular basis, preferably two, three times a week for at least you know, 15, 20 minutes at a time, just, just appreciating each other, just affirming each other. We talk about different parenting styles that are effective with children and teens. And there's actually a fair amount of research on this, that the optimal parenting style tends to be one that's often referred to as authoritative. OK, and I, I will talk with you about the um, characteristics of an authoritative parenting relationship. So basically, there are, um, researchers have talked about two main dimensions of parenting, one being the level of affection, and the other being the level of control. Um, the level of affection basically refers to how close or warm the relationship is. And in general, as you might imagine, it is helpful for parents to have a warm, close, caring relationship with their teen or with their child. Okay? And it's kind of hard to be too affectionate, although you don't want to be so affectionate that your child doesn't appreciate it or, or is kind of shying away. So you have to kind of know your child and, and know um, how much you can show affection. But, you know, Generally speaking, it's important to have a warm, close relationship. The control dimension is a little bit trickier. Certainly, it is problematic to have a low level of control, because a low level of control oftentimes would not provide a child or a teen a sufficient amount of monitoring or supervision. And certainly, during the teenage years, parents need to be involved. They need to know what, ki what their kids are doing. Uh, they need to provide a relatively high level of oversight or supervision. So a permissive or um, uh, an uncontrolling parent could be problematic. By the same token, a parent who is highly controlling uh, could, could uh, have a relationship with a child that could result in, in, in a rebellious attitude or, or a kind of obstinate um, oppositional type of behavior. Because the child, the teen, is, is wanting more independence and is feeling like the parent is being you know, much too involved or much too controlling. And so the optimal seems to be somewhere up in here with a relatively high level of affection and a relatively high level of control. And we call that style an authoritative one. And that's, you know, that certainly is appropriate and important with children, but it continues to be important through the teenage years. It's just that you have to, it manifests itself differently during the, during the adolescent years. Key to success, obviously, is for the parent to be consistently positive with their teen, to create a home climate that is primarily positive and nurturing. Um, and the way that to do that is to use high rates of positive reinforcement. Now we, we talk to parents of younger children about this con constantly. And we actually educate teachers to do the same thing with students in the classroom. Same principle applies in parenting a teen is high rates of attention and praise for responsible behavior, for kind behavior, for altruistic behavior, um, providing privileges to teens contingent upon their behaving in an appropriate, um, responsible way, following the rules and so forth. And, and also, um, I, you know, certainly would be appropriate for a teen is providing them with monetary reinforcers or, or an allowance contingent upon certain kinds of behaviors. That all gets negotiated out with the teen. There certainly is a place for punishment. You know, although we emphasize positive reinforcement, punishment can be uh, effective if used relatively sparingly and strategically. Okay, you, have to, you, know, you have to make a decision ahead of time what you're going to target for punishment and what you're going to kind of ignore and uh, not, not focus on. 
And common forms of punishment that can be very effective would just be even verbal correction. We don't typically think about verbal correction as a form of punishment, but giving your child feedback about you did it this way, you really need to do it this other way. That, that's a verbal correction, and that is a form of punishment. We need to understand that as punishment. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. It becomes problematic if it's used too frequently. And then you begin to set a negative tone. Your child begins to, could become discouraged and actually um, it could fuel some rebellion against the parent. Another common form of punishment with children and teens would be a loss of privileges. All right, and so we typically recommend for children at every age, including teenagers, a ratio of at least five times more positive reinforcement to punishment. And for, you know, for kids who are very sensitive, you made reference to um, youth who are anxious, oftentimes a ratio that's more like eight to one, 10 to one is needed because they're, they're very sensitive, they can be very sensitive to punishment. So you really need a very, very positive home climate and high rates of positive reinforcement. Right, it's helpful in thinking about punishment, in thinking about reinforcement and punishments, it's helpful to make the distinction between children's rights and gifts that are given to them and privileges. And so rights, I think, you know, we understand that, you know, and I think virtually every parent would, would accept this and understand this, that children and teens, just because they're human beings and they live in your family and because you love them, they deserve certain things like food, clothing, shelter, and your love. And that's unconditional. That's not something that we give contingent upon responsible behavior or remove when children are not responsible. We give that to children and teens just because of who, we, who they are. And then we have gifts. I mean, gifts are objects that are freely given by, by parents to, to children and teens. We give it to them because we care for them. We often give them gifts at birthday time, perhaps during certain holidays like Christmas. Um, these are things that we typically give, and we don't expect that we're going to take them away if kids are not responsible. Okay, it's freely given, and um, it's not something that you would be taking away. By the same token, you want to be thinking when, you're, when you give a teen a gift, you want to be thinking about something that you're okay giving the child but not taking away. Okay, and given that the use of a car particularly among individuals with ADHD, is something that at times you may need to give and you may need to remove that privilege. Um, we typically recommend that parents would not buy a car for a teen, particularly a teen with ADHD, because if you buy it and it's a gift, it's kind of hard to take that away. It may be perceived as kind of unfair if parents take that away. We also oftentimes think about a, a smartphone could potentially, like getting your child, your teen, a new smartphone, that, that could be a gift, but perhaps the, um, the fees that are associated with that might be something that the teen understands um, he or she has to contribute to in some way. Okay, so the, the fees could, could be something that could be, um, could build into kind of a privilege system or a, a token system. And then there are privileges, and privileges are consequences that need to be earned, okay? And you earn them by behaving in a responsible way, by following the rules, and by, you know, really doing what you're supposed to be doing. And privileges are consequences that can be given, and they can be removed. If they're given, then it's a reinforcement. If they're removed, then it's a punishment. I mean, I think that you know, we could actually get into a really good discussion about whether a, it is essential to have a smartphone or whether it's a privilege that one gets. I mean, in, in this culture at this point in time, I mean, virtually every teen, certainly teens who are driving age, virtually all of them have smartphones. And they're, they're communicating with each other. And quite frankly, they're communicating with us. And we appreciate the communications and the text to let us know where they are and when they're going to be home and if they're going to be running late. So it, you know, one could argue that, that having a smartphone, at least in, cer in certain situations, is, is kind of essential. It may be the, the, um, the conditions under which you are allowed to have the smartphone 
um, that really end up getting negotiated. But, but just having a smartphone is probably something that most of us would say would be essential for this age range. It's really essential that the parent and the teen develop good communication skills. Obviously, the parent needs to set the tone for that. And good communication begins with effective listening. And so when we talk about listening, obviously, we're talking not just about tracking the words that a teen uses, but listening really carefully and trying to get a sense about the intention behind the words, what they really mean, sometimes what they say may be different from what they really mean. You have to kind of read between the lines a little bit. Perhaps you need to ask a few questions to kind of really get to, to the underlying message. And also to, to listen for what the feelings are and, and to reflect that. Okay? By listening in that way, certainly your, um, your child would feel better understood, but also, but also affirmed. Okay? And there are many opportunities during the course of a day, certainly during the course of a week, to listen to your, to your children. It can happen, you know, perhaps more formally in, a, in the scenario that's depicted here, that maybe you actually sit down and have a conversation with your team. But those opportunities may be not that common during a course of a really busy week. But while you're perhaps sharing a meal together, even if it's for five or 10 minutes, um, just taking a moment to uh, empty your own mind and just kind of listen to what your teen is saying. Um, and, and then trying to reflect what you hear as the real meaning and the intention behind that can really be a sign that you're effectively listening. Okay, and then, you know, communication obviously involves stating our messages clearly to the teen. And, you know, there's, there's several kind of rules of thumb of how to communicate effectively with a teen. But one of them is to, is to make an, an I statement when a teen does something that bothers you or perhaps has an effect on the family routine. You know, um, we oftentimes as parents have a tendency, well, we oftentimes feel angry about that. We may have a tendency to get angry with the teen and to make a you statement. You're so irresponsible, there you go again. You know, you are, you just, you keep messing up this family. Okay, so it's a you statement that shares uh, a message of blame to the teen. It gives feedback, but not in a way that would be helpful or constructive. And oftentimes, it would result in the teen feeling resentful. And that would obviously not, not be an effective way of communicating. So we oftentimes recommend that parents communicate using, using an I message. So instead of saying, you are irresponsible, you could say something like, so when you say, when you say that you hate me, Okay, which teens, you know, I don't know, I, I, I had at least one of my teenage kids um, a few years ago say to me more than one time, I hate you. Uh, hard thing for a parent to hear. And I, I usually, you know, when, when it happened, I tried to like let it go for a moment, you know, cool off a little bit because I was angry to hear that uh, or angry to hear him say that to my wife. So cool off a little bit. But then, um, hopefully a few minutes later, say something like, when you say that you hate me or you say that you hate mom, it hurts me. Okay? So when you say this, I feel hurt, as opposed to, you know, you're, you know, you're, you know, you're so irresponsible, you know, you don't, you don't appreciate mom and me after all that we do, that kind of thing. Okay? So sending a, an I message that indicates uh, what the behavior is and how you feel about that. And, you know, oftentimes when parents do that, the emotion that they, that they frequently associate with the behavior is the first emotion that comes to them, which is anger. Okay, and oftentimes what they, what they would state to their teen is, when you do this, I feel angry at you. And that, that is likely accurate in the moment, but that may not necessarily have its attendant effect. If you can actually get to the emotion that lies beneath the anger, and in a situation like the one that I described with, with the comment that the teen makes about, I hate you, the underlying emotion, the emotion that underlies the anger is the hurt. Sharing the hurt in relationship to that behavior likely would have a, a better effect on the teen than sharing the anger which could arouse you know, resentment on the teen's part and then get, get back into an argument. Another, another example that I might give 
which I think you know, commonly happens you know, with parents of teenagers, is when kids come in late. Okay, so when kids come in late, now we're not just talking about a few minutes, but they, they come in really late and they, they don't let you know and you're not able to get in touch with them. So uh, an I statement might be, when you walk in the house an hour late, you might have a, you know, you're feeling angry, but you get, you're kind of working through that. So instead of saying, I am so angry with you, you might say, I get really worried. Because the worry and the fear is, as a parent, that really is the underlying emotion. Right? I mean, parents worry that something happened to their child, that um, they, may have gotten, they may have gotten in an accident or something happened to them or whatever. And so reflecting the underlying anxiety, fear, or worry in that situation actually could potentially be more effective. Because that, that would be an effective I statement. Okay? Um, another type of comment that could be made that would be an example of good communication would be to point out the contrast. This, this, type, of, this type of strategy is often used in motivational interviewing if you've ever had any training in that. So, so it, it actually points out the contrast between what the, what the person, in this case the teen, has stated as their goal or their intention and what they're actually doing, what their behavior is. Okay, so let's say that, let's say that you get a notice from the school that and it occurs in the, in the middle of a quarter that the teen is not submitting homework on a regular basis in social studies class and is is generally speaking not prepared for class. Okay, and you, this notice comes home and you look at it. And, and as a parent, my first reaction probably would be um, one of annoyance. You know, it's like, here we go again. I'd want to make a use statement. There you go again. You know, you're, you're being irresponsible about your schoolwork. Uh, but, but pointing out the contrast, you could say something like, you know, you know we talked about just, just just a, a few weeks ago, we had a discussion about your, your goals at school. And you know, we talked about how your goal, was, your goal was to go to college, and that in order to get there, that your short-term goal was to get at least a B in every course, or, or perhaps just one C, to get um, mostly Bs, maybe one C and a couple of As, okay, and to be a responsible student. Okay, so how does, so the, here's the contrast. Uh, how does not turning in your homework and not preparing for class help you to meet your goal? Okay, so you're basically, you're reminding the teen of the goal that was stated through a conversation with you, and then you're pointing out the contrast between the behavior and the stated goal. Okay, and that just pointing out discrepancies would be commonly done in motivational interviewing. It can be an effective communication technique. Any comments about that, or does that make sense? So this just based, and this is also from that same book, Defiant Teens. This just reviews some you know, common bad habits of communication and maybe some alternative actions. So one bad habit would be to interrupt, okay, obviously. Um, the alternative would be to take turns, to take turns talking and listening. We talked about a bad habit being making a you statement or a blaming statement versus an I statement that reflects the underlying emotion. Instead of demand, making demands of your teen, making a clear, firm request. Instead of criticizing, and you know, I think this is something we often do with, in, with people at work. And we oftentimes, we, you know, with, with somebody at work, if you wanted to, to provide some feedback, we wouldn't typically bring them in the office and just criticize them. Okay, we would point out some areas that we appreciate and maybe point out some areas that need improvement. So you could point out, and, and in this case, you, know, you, you could do that or point out areas of agreement and disagreement. Instead of becoming defensive, there may be some feedback that your teen is reflecting to you that actually may be well-founded, and so that you accept the comments that, that make sense and that are defensible, and then you, uh, but then perhaps you point out some areas of disagreement. Uh, obviously, lecturing would be ineffective. The alternative to that would be just, if you got something to say, say it briefly and to the point. And then uh, sarcasm, there's no place for sarcasm. Sarcasm 
basically is punishment. When you're sarcastic, you're basically punishing the person to whom you're using um, sarcasm. And so if you don't have anything good to say, just basically don't say anything at all. It's kind of a good rule of thumb. So just kind of moving on to some other strategies. Obviously, helping your teen understand the challenges of having ADHD and the effect that that can have on behavior, academic performance, learning to drive, and then actually driving is really important. And hopefully, you know, your teen is over time is growing into a greater understanding of what ADHD is and how ADHD has an effect on him and her, him or her, and how that can affect academic performance, work, social relationships, and driving. And the parents obviously have a role in educating their teens about this. We don't, you know, the effective, effective education is, is once again not lecturing our teens, but having these discussions that begin with listening, listening for real meaning and listening for feelings. They're very dialogic. They basically try to get some sense about what the teen's current understanding is and then build on that as, as opposed to the parent, you know, doing a lot, doing a lot of talking. Okay, just find out what your teen is currently, how your teen currently views things and kind of um, build on that and, and, and use the teen's own words to the extent that you can. Um, some people have, have used educational approaches that are are referred to as scared straight, okay? That if you don't do X, Y, and Z, these incredibly awful things can happen to you and you can end up in prison or you can be in the hospital or something like that, okay? And um, fortunately, I don't see as many of those educational messages on television as I did like 15 or 20 years ago. I don't know whether you still see them, but it used to be, it used to be like really very common. The D.A.R.E. program? The D.A.R.E. program. The DARE program is a really good example of a, a program that uses that approach that has been demonstrated repeatedly not to be effective, which you probably know. And so, uh, and so other people have tried to use this approach, and it, it just doesn't work. And, um, and, I, and actually, teens react to these things in a way that is, is not constructive. They often just kind of turn it right off. And so, you know, what we want to be doing is educating in a way that would, that would indicate that, that we believe that you can be successful, that we have a lot of hope that you'll be able to face these challenges related to driving or, or whatever the case might be, and that you'll be able to develop the skills to overcome the challenges and, and be effective. Um, it's not easy. I mean, driving as a person with ADHD is fraught with challenges, but um, we're, we're going to support you, and we believe that you can be successful. Okay? And so this is something that um, rarely, if ever, I'd be interested in your reactions to that, rarely, if ever, gets discussed. And so a virtu I, think, I think it's basically mandatory in, in, in Pennsylvania and Jersey for kids to have driver education. Driver education typically happens in a vacuum that's totally unrelated to what happens at home. Fa parents typically are not involved in any way with this. But, but it is education, and it's really important. And I think if it's at all possible, I think it's important for parents to try to find out who the driving instructor, instructor is, to meet the person, to have a conversation, to, for the parent to let the driver instructor know that if you have any questions or concerns, please talk with us about that, preferably with the teen present, so that we can um, have an understanding of it and maybe uh, do some problem solving about that. Okay. But just being involved, I think, is really very, very important. This, um, this point was driven home to me when my daughter, who's my youngest child, completed driver's education. And I was so appreciative that her driving instructor, after the classes were over, took the initiative and called us on the phone to let us know that even though, he said that even though your daughter has completed driver education and she doesn't need to go to any more classes, I would not consider her to be a good driver. And I just want you to know this and that she's going to require a lot of additional support. Well, this is something actually we already knew um, from driving along with her, but having him reach out to us and highlight the importance of uh, providing addi additional guidance 
and coaching to her was something that we really appreciated. But I've actually, I've had a chance to present to dri uh, driving instructors, and I talked about the idea of reaching out to families, maybe sending emails or just letting families know, uh, introducing yourself to the families, letting them know that they can contact you and encouraging them to contact you. That was a novel idea for them. And that's something that I don't think any of them had ever really done that. But the more they thought about it, the more they thought that it could really help to promote safe driving, particularly for kids who are more vulnerable, like, like individuals who have ADHD or perhaps um, autism spectrum disorder or some other kind of um, disability. One talked about effective problem solving strategies. And, and we talk about this a lot with um, families of teenagers, but I want to talk about it specifically related to communicating and negotiating with teens related to driving. And then because and then, I want to set up negotiating and contracting related to driving in a couple of minutes. So, you know, we talked about the importance of having a strong parent teen relationship. The foundation for that begins obviously when children are much younger. It really helps to go into adolescence with a strong parent-teen relationship. And then just to keep working at it every single day to, to strengthen it. Um, another strategy that can be really important is to try to find time on a regular basis for the parent and teen to have brief discussions with each other. And they, they don't have to be all that formal or that big of a deal. But there are times that parents and teens can talk about challenges that arise, which happen all the time, like related to school or related to going out somewhere, or related to the challenge of driving and how you're going to deal with that. And so if you can get into the habit of having these conversations, sometimes they happen over the course of a, of a meal, even, even if it's a brief meal, or maybe in the car when, when the parent's driving, having a little conversation. But getting in the habit of having these brief brief conversations can be really helpful to work out some of the difficulties that parents and teens face, such as how to deal with driving. Um, teens may often ask, you know, you know, I don't really want to do this. You know, what am I going to get out of it? What teens can get out of it is they, they can, um, through these discussions, they can potentially negotiate more privileges. Okay, like, you know, privileges related to cell phone use, privileges related to um, maybe paying off car insurance or that kind of thing, uh, uh, getting more of an allowance. I think it's really important to keep these discussions brief. They, these don't have to be, and they, actually they shouldn't be like hour long, even half hour long. These can be like 10 minute conversations. I think oftentimes helpful to use a timer just to make sure that they're brief and they end on a positive note. There's just some basic ground rules for any good discussion with, with anybody, whether it's with a teen or, or you know, between partners or spouses. Obviously, one person talks at a time. If one person's talking, the other person listens. It, that you have to control your emotions and, and don't blame each other. Okay? There's, um, there may be little infractions of the rules that happen during these conversations. Typically, the, the minor infractions, I think, best for a parent just to kind of ignore that. Obviously, if the infractions become more frequent or they become more significant, so it's difficult to, to, to maintain the conversation, then the discussion has to end, and then you pick up at some other point in time. Okay, so with that as a, as a foundation, and hopefully the parent and teen are engaging you know, regularly in these brief discussions, communications and negotiations, can have discussions about getting ready to drive. And which begins with a brainstorm of what would be targets, tar tar behaviors to target in problem solving that are eventually going to be identified in a contract. And so some examples of uh, target behaviors could be where, you know, when you're driving to call when you arrive at your destination. You know, we, you know, we as a family, we need to know where you are. Okay, so when, you know, if you're planning to go to an event, just when you get there, let us know that. That's, that's, that could be a target behavior. Another potential target behavior is, and we'll talk about this, to use text blocking app when driving. Okay, I don't know if you know about them, but they exist. And uh, in some situations, that may be something that could get negotiated and put into a contract. Another example would be, uh, 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 
a classic example would be to come home at the designated time. If you say that you're going to be home um, at 6 o'clock for dinner, that, that you're home. Or that you say that you're going to be coming home at 10 o'clock, that you're home at that time. Okay? During these conversations, you repeatedly, af repeatedly affirm the teen for listening, for collaborating, for um, in engaging in, um, in good discussion. And stop the conversations when it's still going well. Don't wait for things to deteriorate. Okay? Next step would be, so you have, a, you have a sense about what the possible target behaviors would be. You also have to have a sense about what the, what the rewards could be. And we talked about, we have a couple of examples already. One clear reward would be that if you demonstrate the target behaviors, you're, you're responsible about calling us when you get places and coming home on time. You, you get more driving time. Okay? We're willing, you know, you know, we've agreed that you're going to pay a certain amount for your, to con you're going to contribute a certain amount to your insurance, but we'll make a greater contribution to pay your insurance if you build up credits. Um, it also could be, you know, additional um, money for an allowance. Uh, just maybe some examples. You maybe could think of some as well. You just have to have some way of recording you know, when they earn credit and how much progress there needs to be. You know, and, and, you know, when kids are younger, we have star systems and charts and stuff like that. You know, with teens, 16, 17, 18, it, it, you know, it's just whatever works for them. I just keeping track in a ledger or something like that would be, so we just have to kind of keep track of when they get the credits and when they cash them in. All right, and finally, we just we want to kind of narrow down. So we, we don't want to be working on too many target behaviors at a time. We want to kind of narrow it down to just a few, okay? Because a teen can really only focus on a few things at a time. Adults usually only focus on a couple things at a time. You want to narrow down your reward menu, and then we're going to draw up a contract. I'll show you an example in a second. Parent and teen signs that off, and then you move on. And so contracts can be quite involved. We, typically recommend something pretty straightforward and simple, okay, which would stipulate that the contract is between the teen and the parent, when you can indicate what date the contract was established. The, um, the teen agrees to work on these target behaviors and will receive a certain amount of credit. And you figure out, you know, you know, whatever. Calling us when you reach your destination could get three credits or something like that, I don't know, or three points. When the teen achieves identified goals, the parent agrees to provide the reward selected. The following are the rewards and their value. We talked about some examples of rewards. And you know, once again, teens love money or some, the equivalent of money. So that something in that area um, oftentimes works. If a teen does not achieve the goals, the rewards are not given. Regardless of how much the teen might argue or resist or whatever, it's very, very simple. You Perform the target behaviors, you earn the credits, you get the rewards. If not, you don't get the rewards. Both parties agree to the contract. If disputes arise, and disputes always arise with contracts, you know, a teen will point out that something is not clear or something is not fair. The time to talk about that is not in the middle of when you're you know, trying to figure something out. The time to talk about that is the next time you get together to, to have a little meeting. Okay. And then you can renegotiate the contract, roll up a new contract, and then sign it again and, and uh, indicate the date. OK, any, any comments about this? Behavioral contracts are kind of like a hallmark of effective behavior management with teens. And you know, effective contracting requires there to be a strong parent-teen relationship. So you always have to invest in that. It requires that there be some basic good communication, which starts with the parent listening on a regular basis to the teen, and some ability to kind of negotiate. And then with that in place, then you can develop behavioral contracts. And then you can use behavioral contracting for all kinds of different things. And, and as I say, I'll give, I'm going to go into this more deeply in terms of how to use contracts to negotiate when it's, when it's time to go get your permit, when it's time to move forward and get your license, which your, your child just did. And, uh, and when, you can, when you can actually get access to the car and for how long, those all get negotiated out. Before we get into examples of contracting, uh, I just want to make a comment about 
being a good role model. This is so obvious, but how many of us are not very good role models for our children and teens? How many of us, you know, just get into a habit of driving too fast, taking turns a little bit too quickly, running a red light? The kinds of things that we wouldn't want our teens to do, but we do it. I mean, I think virtually all of us do that. I mean, when your child is going, your teen is going through the learning to drive phase, hopefully a year or two or three before that, you are modeling for them effective and safe driving behavior. And that's really important. Otherwise, otherwise we're hypocrites. You know, it's like, you know, say as I say, but not as I do. And that happens all the time. And, and you know, we can see it when other parents do it, but sometimes we don't see it when we're the. Talk about medication. So medication can be an effective intervention for driving. Okay? And this, this talk is not a talk about medication. I'm just going to make a couple of comments about this. I think you already know a lot about medicine. There are basically, um, well, three main kinds of medication, but the, the first line of medication is the stimulants. The stimulants continue to be the most commonly studied and the most effective medications that we have. And there's, there's two different kinds of stimulants, the methylphenidate derivatives, and I gave a couple of uh, brand names, and the amphetamine derivatives. Okay, and they both work equally well, although not necessarily equi equally well for a particular child but just in general, they work equally well. And then there are the second line of medication. There's two different kinds of medications that, uh, that come after the stimulants. One is adamoxetine, which is the brand name that people often um, know is Stratera, and the other is the alpha-2 agonist. Yeah. And a couple of common brand names would be Intuitiv and Capbay. Okay, so medication, particularly the stimulants, can help teens to drive more effectively, can help to reduce distractibility, can help to reduce some of the impulsivity that can lead to unsafe driving behaviors. Okay, but, and uh, these are just some examples of, of uh, what stimulant medication can do. Okay, and there have been several studies of the effect of what, what happens to teens when they drive on a driving simulator. Okay, there's actually most of the research is with teens and using a driving simulator because it's easier and safer to do research in that setting than to actually get them on the road. <clears throat> um, but we know that teens frequently don't want to take medication. These may very well be the same individuals who took medication for five years when they were children, but when they become teens, they may not want to use the medicine for a variety of different reasons. So, Oftentimes, we deal with issues of resistance to medication or non-adherence with medication when, it, when um, children become teens. And, you know, this is, once again, it, everything begins with relationship and communication. Okay, without the relationship and communication, you can't have these discussions about medication. Um, obviously, you can't force a teen to take medicine. I mean, e even if you tried, if a teen didn't want to take it, you're not going to get anywhere. I mean, a teen can always sabotage you with regard to taking medication. And so, but the thing that you can do is, in the context of establishing a contract with your teen, you can say that, you know, um, even though medication can help people to drive more safely, I, you know, I, I can't force you to take medication. I mean, that's a decision that you really need to come to on your own, along with me and the doctor, but you have a big say. And even if your parent and the doctor think it's a good idea, if you don't think it's a good idea, then you're not going to take it. You shouldn't take it. Um, but at the very least, it's important for you to get educated about this and to make an informed decision. Okay, and then whatever you decide to do, that's, that's really, that's fine. Okay, so you can, you can um, establish in your contract an understanding that you need to meet with your doctor, you need to get educated, the doctor like, may very well give you some materials or refer you to a, a book for teens or whatever, and that's something that, that you can read. You need to make an informed choice. Whatever you decide to do, then we will we'll, we'll move forward with that. If medication is agreeable to you, then we can start a trial or, or do a retrial of medication if you took it as a younger person. If medication is not acceptable to you, then 
that's fine, but we're, we're going to need to develop a more intensive behavioral plan if you're not going to be using medication. All right, so let's talk about cell phone use. So obviously texting when driving is dangerous and it's actually illegal in most states, including New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Can't do it. And so um, there's, a, there's an increased risk for all drivers to get into accidents when they're texting. The risk is higher for young drivers. The risk is even higher for young ADHD drivers. Okay? And even, um, even talking on the cell phone is dangerous. It, it may not be unlawful in some states to talk on the cell phone, um, but it is more dangerous and it, it really needs to be avoided. So we talk about uh, cell phone blocking <coughs> technology. As you might, I, I indicated at least one example of that text blocker, that there are apps that that um, basically when used, they, uh, the cell phone will almost, almost shut off. Child will not be able to receive or send a text, receive or send a phone call when the device gets activated. The device gets activated when your car moves at a certain speed. It, I think it's like five or 10 miles an hour. It will activate the cell phone blocking technology. I, I think most of the technologies would allow an individual still to make an emergency call, a 911 call if you had to, if something were to happen. But otherwise, it blocks incoming and outgoing text and, um, and other communications. And some apps actually can be set up so that parents can be alerted if a teen were to shut off the app. So a parent would know about that, OK? So that is a strategy that is available, although that would be something that would have to get negotiated, OK? So any comments or questions about the material we just talked about? OK. And so, so let's talk about the conditions under which it would, might be appropriate for a teen to get a permit. OK. And these are, um, these are recommendations. They may not apply in every particular case. No evidence of alcohol or drug use for, uh, you know, six, for a 16 or 17 year old. Acceptable grades in school. Now, you know, some teens, particularly teens with ADHD, struggle academically. And so you know, we want to be realistic about what acceptable grades would be. We don't necessarily have to expect really strong grades. But the, the, the teen needs to demonstrate responsible behavior by getting at least acceptable grades. Pattern of following curfews, that, that you follow the household rules. That's just, once again, you're demonstrating responsible behavior. You're demonstrating that you're responsible enough to take on a, uh, a major privilege like uh, getting a permit. It could be part of the plan to meet with a doctor to discuss the treatment plan, to learn about medication, learn about effects and side effects, and consider whether that might be appropriate for you to, to use that you've already demonstrated that you know, you're willing to have conversations with me. Um, we've already, we have a history of contracting. And you really, you've cooperated with that. Um, you know, sometimes things go awry, but generally you take it seriously. We have discussions on a regular basis, and that works out well for you. You're, you're somebody um, who really tries to cooperate. And you have a track record of basically fulfilling your contracts. Okay, so that, these are all indications that we're, your teen is becoming increasingly responsible and may be able to handle the very important privilege of being able to drive. Okay. All right. So then these might be conditions for getting a license. I think basically the same conditions as those for getting a permit, but these might be some additional things to consider. You want to make sure that your child understands graduated driver licensing laws in the state. Almost every state now has a graduated driver licensing set of regulations, which, which refer to, uh, they usually have restrictions on passengers that can be in the vehicle, and also uh, there uh, are established curfews for driving in most states. Um, because the t your teen has ADHD, you may require more extended training on the road than what teens might typically have. 
and you, you, know, you may, I don't know if you want to share your own experience because your, your teen just got, uh, got his license. You may want to consider an independent evaluation of readiness for licensure. So, you know, as we talked about, a teen gets driver education, but that doesn't necessarily mean the teen is ready to drive. My daughter wasn't ready to drive after that. In fact, it was, we still had many harrowing experiences on the road. Um, and my, my wife would actually never drive with her. I always had to go through that myself. So you may want to you may want to pay a driver at instruction to do an independent evaluation. You know, is this teen ready to drive? And perhaps another another clause that you would want to include in the contract would be an agreement to use cell phone blocking technology. I put optional there because that, that would be something that you and the teen could could consider whether or not you want to make that part of the plan. Okay, do you have any comments or experiences that you'd want to share with regard to this? Still, you know, still have all kinds of important decisions to make about under what conditions should your teen have the privilege to drive and un under what conditions and for how long. So these might be considerations. Using medication, if your teen um, is using medication um, at that time. Following curfews, no evidence of drug and alcohol. Once again, continuing cooperation during negotiations, during these problem solving sessions, maintaining acceptable grades. If you've decided to use cell phone blocking technology, that there's evidence that you're using it, that you're not turning it off while you're driving, and that you follow the graduated driver licensing laws in, in New Jersey and Pennsylvania or whatever, whatever state you're in. Yeah. It, yeah, it is. That's interesting. So that, that could potentially be another condition that, that you may want to add is that you, that you demonstrate some independence when, when challenges come up or unforeseen circumstances arrive, whether it's related to driving or in other areas, and that you're resourceful and that you, you have ways of figuring things out. Or if you can't figure it out on your own, you, you, know, you know whom to contact to get some information or some advice about that uh, outside of your, your mom and dad. Okay, and that mom and dad can see that you're becoming increasingly resourceful and responsible, uh, and so that you can, you know, you can handle a challenge if it were to arise, and, and that happens when you drive. I mean, you can't foresee everything, right? right. And that, that can be really hard for parents to get to that place, to get to a place at which they maybe accept that this is going to go on, let's say, among seniors in high school, certainly when kids go to college, and sometimes even before they reach senior year in high school, and that you don't want to be so restrictive that, that kids are not able to share certain things with you. Let, let's say when they're out late at night and they already have a license and they, they, have, they have been drinking and they shouldn't be getting into a car and they let you know that they're going to be staying overnight. They may not let you know all the full story, but um, they let you know that they're going to be staying overnight, you know, and in you reading between the lines, just say, okay, I trust that you're making the right decision. As opposed to a kid who feels like, geez, I need to get home because I don't want mom and dad to think maybe they may be up driving. And so they end up driving, you know, when they've been drinking, which would be an example of not being resourceful and not being independent and, and dealing with a challenge that can arise, you know, when you have a license. Right. Obviously, helping Helping kids to learn to drive safely starts early. One could argue that the, that the process really begins when they're, you know, when they're just young children. And because that, that, that's when we, that's when we lay the foundation for a strong parenting relationship. That's when we lay the foundation for being able to communicate and have brief discussions and, and educate our, our children about what ADHD is and what it means to you and what the challenges are. And just keep working on this relationship as your teen gets older. It, it's so hard to, you know, you, know, um, you know, as a clinician, you know, parents so frequently, you know, make referrals to us, you know, can, can you help us to deal with our family better? If parents enter the, the teenage years with their teen with ADHD or their teen with any other kind of uh, difficulty, and they don't have the basis of a really strong foundation and a, and a good relationship, it is really hard to help them. Not to say that you can't help them, but when, you know, adolescence brings its own issues and challenges, and when you have a rocky relationship during the childhood period entering adolescence, it is really complicated to be able to deal with that. Uh, and it, it just is, um, 
the process is so much more conflictual, time consuming, and difficult when you don't have the basis of the good communication. You practice good communicating all the time, and, and, it, and it starts by, once again, parent always, always remembering to try to be a good listener. I think it's important to pull in the child's doctor, or perhaps an ADHD specialist, to address these issues. Um, because most parents have a hard time figuring this stuff out on their own, and there are resources that are readily available. Um, become an expert at communicating, negotiating. You know, very few of us are experts at listening, communicating, negotiating. Even, you know, I as a psychologist have been doing this for a really long time. I, I claim no particular expertise when it comes to my own children, okay? You know, we just become really humbled when it comes to being able to kind of parent. And there's, there's so many things that, I, looking back, my, my, my children are all adults, kind of looking back, wishing that I, I was always real involved with my kids, but there's some topics that I shied away from, probably because I was uncomfortable with it. I think particularly with the teenage driving situation, because I was uncomfortable with it, and, and I had questions and I thought about it, but I probably should have been more involved and raised the questions, even though I likely, it likely would have aroused some degree of resentment and conflict that I, I didn't shy away from that. I wasn't afraid to ask the tough questions, even though it would have been tricky to negotiate. And we just, sometimes, sometimes it's like, it's in the messiness and in the arguing that you, you kind of make your points um, while trying to maintain some emotional control and not, not kind of losing it, right? But you can't, you can't be afraid just, can't be afraid just to get in there and just, you know, say the things that need to be said and just hang in there when your kid overreacts and screams and yells at you and says, I hate you, not to take it that personally and just, just you know, uh, make your points while keeping control of yourself. And as I said, I, I, there's uh, definitely times that I could have done a better job on that. And, you know, the final point there is to focus on, keep it positive, keep focusing on the positive. And, you know, I guess, and just keep trying to maintain uh, emotional control ourselves because, it, you know, parenting a teen can be a very emotional experience. It can be a very exhausting experience. It can um, definitely be frustrating. It can result in a lot of periods of exasperation and just anger and just being able to um, control your own emotions and hang in there uh, is, is just critically important. Many individuals have a difficult time regulating their emotions, but, but, but particularly um, people with ADHD have a hard time regulating. I mean, that, that's, it's almost like central to the disorder is to have difficulty regulating your behavior and your emotions. And cer certainly, um, you know, um, behavioral, dis uh, behavioral inhibition is really, really closely connected with the, the emotion regulation system, like in the brain. So, you know, we, ha we actually have to kind of, we have to understand that about our teens, and they need to learn to understand that about themselves, that they may have a more difficult, they may be prone to more intense reactions than the average teen, and they may have a hard, and then when they're experiencing those strong emotions, they may have a difficult time recognizing them, <clears throat> that is becoming aware of them, and, and then just managing them effectively. But they definitely, can impair attention even more than it already is. They can, they can uh, impair judgment and decision making more than, let's say, when you're in a less emotional state. So that, that's a really good point. So we as parents need to learn to, to manage our emotions as a way to model that for the teens, but, but we need to help them to develop strategies and skills. And, and once again, that, you know, when does that begin? I mean, that, hopefully that begins in childhood, by modeling for teens, you know, how to handle, how to, how to prevent outbursts, how to handle anxiety, how to handle um, anger, and by, you know, and by just educating them and having conversations with them. And, and then noticing when they're, doing a, when they're doing a good job with regulation, uh, emotion regulation, and reflecting that to them. And it is so common for a child or a teen with ADHD to have at least one parent who has ADHD. I mean, we know that an estimate about 40% of families in which there is a child with ADHD, there's at least one biological parent. So th these are really common situations. But the essence of ADHD is to have a difficult time with behavior and emotion regulation, whether you're a child, a teen, or an adult. 
And so when you have multiple individuals within a family who are having a difficult time regulating behavior, regulating emotions, it, it can it can you know result in an emotional climate that that may not always be optimal for for child development and uh, and adult development and so but but people do it right and and i don't know whether you want to share some ideas of like things that you have done or things that you know other families have done in order to pull this off i mean obviously many adults with adhd seek out treatment and get help for themselves, whether that's medication or cognitive behavior therapy or perhaps the combination of it. That can be helpful in addition to getting help for their teens, in addition to maybe doing some family work together where they're, they're working on communication, negotiation, contracting. I mean, because I, mean, I, I talked about a lot of strategies that can be very difficult for a parent to employ on his or her own without some guidance from a professional. And so, you know, some families work it out by getting that additional assistance or, or coaching. There certainly are disparities along socioeconomic lines about um, your access to high quality and affordable providers, whether they be medical providers or, you know, mental health providers <clears throat> or, the, or the combination of the two. It can be difficult to get access to them and get access to to professionals who are really highly trained, specifically related to ADHD and maybe some other conditions that, that occur along with that. And so um, it's not fair, but it is unfortunately the, the reality. And, and it's particularly when you're talking about behavior therapy, cognitive behavior therapy, family therapy, it takes time in addition to good insurance and, and, and um, financial resources. And when, say, well, both, both parents are working, Kids, kid, teenagers often have extremely busy schedules, after school activities, homework, all kinds of different things that are going on in addition to what's going on with the parents. I mean, to find, and it's not just an hour for the therapy session. It can be an hour to get there and an hour to come home. And Tim, you're talking about like three hours on a weekly basis. I mean, where are you going to find that time? So those are the, the typical barriers, if you will, to getting the support. Um, Obviously, you figured out a way to do that, but it's, it's not easy to do that. And, and for some families, they may have more advantages with regard to getting that than others.